delight to be out with you and to see each one. We are so thankful for your presence, for this opportunity to gather here as uh, the Eastside Church of Christ. We are thankful for our visitors and we ask that you stick around and let us get to know you a little bit and also that you would stick around and, and let us feed you today. Uh, we are always excited about feeding day. And we're pretty good at it around here, and we always have a slew of food, and so we uh, just beg you to allow us to treat you well in that way this day. I want to talk uh, to you today uh, about this question. We're going to ask this question, when will this church be built up? And I want to begin by saying that I love you, and I really do mean that. I want to state at the beginning of this lesson that this is not a lesson to beat you up, but to build you up. I believe with all my heart that we are doing well here at the Eastside Church of Christ. I also believe with all of my heart that the biggest room for us here at the Eastside Church is the room for improvement. We all need to be challenged. We need to be introspective, if you will. Uh, our God is a God of challenges. He gives the challenges and he, uh, he also fixes the challenges. Our Christ is a challenging Christ. Our mission is a challenging mission. Our message is a challenging one. Our life is a challenge. But it ends there. Uh, the challenge ends at death for the faithful. So while we have breath and opportunity, let us consider this question and consider seven answers to the question. And then let us work on building this church up while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. The basis for our text this morning, Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning at verse 18, <clears throat> Then I told them of the hand of, the, of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Nehemiah was a cup bearer. The book of Nehemiah is uh, written by a man named Ezra, the author of Ezra. Ezra was a scribe priest. And he is uh, contemporary with Nehemiah and Esther. And the people of Israel have uh, undergone what God had promised them. And they had been led off into captivity. And they had been destroyed. And Jerusalem has been destroyed. And the walls thereof destroyed. And the people have come back home. But yet the walls have been destroyed. And, and, and Nehemiah is having a hard time with this. And he's a trusted advisor to the king Artaxerxes. He's the cupbearer. The cupbearer is the person who controls the food and the drink that the king enjoys. And so he is always around the king. And he not only was the cupbearer, and he was in charge of the diet of the king, if you will, but he was also an advisor since he was so trusted. And so the king would have had a lot of faith in Nehemiah, and Nehemiah was sad. And he decided that he was going to pray to his God. And not only was he going to pray to his God, but he was going to answer the king when the king asked, what's wrong with you? The king gives him everything he needs to go back home and to fix the problem. Not only does he give him the permission, he gives him the power and he financed the whole shebang. Now that's how God works. You see, when we think of rising up and building, 
It takes someone like Nehemiah. It takes someone just to get the people together, to put their minds to work. They built that wall in just a short span of time, completed the work in what we would consider a record pace. But when are we going to build the church up here at East Side? The first thing is when each member has a deep concern for the lost. We have a personal responsibility to the lost. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus said, Go teach all nations, or go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You know that go ye is plural. And it means each and every one of us need to go and to be doing what God has set for us to do. In Psalm 126, verse 5, the psalmist said, They that sow in tears will reap in joy. They that sow in tears. You know, it's a, a lot of times it's difficult to go about doing what God would have us to do. It's difficult in this day and age with persecution, with people making fun of us for who we are and what we are and what we believe. You go on sowing. Even in tears, and I promise you when the sheaves come in, they'll be rejoicing. Solomon said in Proverbs 11 and verse 30, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. What's going to help me in my personal responsibility to be a soul winner? It's a deep concern for the lost, and it is uh, something that I have got to love my Lord more than anything else. In John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And I have got to love that same world. I've got to love the people who need Jesus so much that I will get out of my way. I will get myself out of the way. And I will be willing to go to the lost and to preach the good news, the saving message of Jesus. You know, there's not a greater message in all the world than for God so loved it, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, sweeter words have never been penned. What we need to decide to do in loving the lost is just to be a servant, just to submit to the kingship of Jesus and choose to be a servant. You know, the servant doesn't give the orders. Uh, the servant does the very thing that he may despise. That's what Jesus did. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus did that which was despised. Will we? Uh, will we do that? Uh, well, I don't like talking to strangers. Well, Jesus died for them. Uh, but they might have a different doctrine than me. They, they may not be believers at all. Then we need to equip ourselves to be able to help them. You see, until you realize that their blood will be on your hands at the judgment, until you come to that realization that you're going to be held accountable for whether you preach the gospel or not, you might not be motivated to work on the areas in which you struggle. But in Ezekiel chapter 3, in Ezekiel chapter 3, I want you to go there with me for a moment, and I want you to notice verses 17 through 21 with me. We're talking about our personal responsibility and our concern for the lost. 
In Ezekiel 3, 17, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and watch it now. Give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, what's going to happen? That man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Notice verse 19, Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. But what has happened? But you have delivered your soul. God does not hold you accountable for success. God holds you accountable for sowing the seed and trusting in him for the crop. Continuing on in verse number 20 again. When a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, notice this, before him he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. We have an obligation to go to those who have left the faith, those who are overtaken in a fault, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. If any of you do err from the faith and one convert him, know that the one which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways saves a soul from death and covers a multitude of sins, James 5 verses 19 and 20. Notice this. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness. He commits iniquity. The Lord lays a stumbling block before him. He's going to die because you've not given him warning. He will die in his sin. But notice this. Uh, and the righteousness which he has done will not be remembered. That's not once saved, always saved, is it? But his blood will I require at thine hand. We're talking about personal responsibility. Notice verse 21, Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that, that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned, and you have delivered your soul. There's personal responsibility, but there's also personal accountability. There is personal accountability in that we will stand before the God of heaven for having not done that. You know, I read yesterday that a man that said that hell is not being filled so much with a shaken fist in the face of God, but with the shrug of a shoulder. Indifference. Eh, someone else's job. Eh, someone else will do it. Eh, I don't have time. Eh, hell is being filled with the shrug of the shoulders. Brethren, indifference towards the lost is antithetical to the proposition that Christianity sets before us. Number two, when each member enters into worship with reverence and enthusiasm, when will this church be built up? When we're excited to come and reverently bow before Him and enthusiastically worship the King of Kings. In Psalm chapter 122, verse 1, the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad. That's my perspective. That's my attitude. How do I think about Sunday morning? How do I think about Bible class? What do I think about Wednesday night? I was glad when they said unto me my perspective. But when they said unto me, that's my petition. God is petitioning us to come into his presence. He, God is inviting us, if you will, to come before him and to give him what is due, what he is worthy of. He said, let us go. That's my purpose. That is my being. That is uh, the meat of what I am about is giving God the glory and honor. Let's do Him. Let's go to the house. That's my place. 
That's where I belong. The house of the Lord with my brethren uh, striving together in unity in the faith of the gospel. And then he says, of the Lord, that's my prince. That's my prince. That's my royal king. That's the one that we bow before and we worship and we adore. In Psalm chapter 89 and verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence of, of all that are about him. So many people have such a flippant attitude towards God and towards worship for him. We see it uh, in, in the world and even among some of our brethren who do not care uh, so much what is revealed here but what they like. And since they like it, God must like it. Brethren, that is coming from a people who have no reverence for God, who do not respect the very things that He has asked for, because worship's not about you, and worship is not about me. Worship is about bowing down before the great I Am. And what's sad is most people evidently do not enjoy coming to worship because they're so late in coming, so early in leaving, and so bored while here. Vance Havener said at one time, too many church services start at 11 o'clock dull. And when the clock strikes 12 at, su at Sunday noon, the church gives up her dead. In Psalm chapter 29 and verse 2, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Give God the glory. Do His name. Worship is an action. It is something that we do. It's not something that we uh, spectate. It's something in which we participate. It's something that we give. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That would be in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23 and 24. Give God the glory. Worship is something that we give. So many people have an attitude, well, I don't get much out of it down there anymore. What do you put into it down there? When I have an attitude that I don't put, get much out of it down there anymore, I am putting myself in the place of reception and I am supposed to be in the place of giving number three when each well this is this is a truth when we enter to worship some want to slip in slump down sleep and slip out and then stay out until the next Lord's Day I thought that was pretty appropriate number three each member when each member is interested in Bible school when will this church be built up? When each member is interested in Bible school. John 6, 44 and 45. The Bible tells us there that no man can come to God or come to Him except the Father which sent Him, Jesus, draws Him. And Jesus said, I will raise Him up in the last day. For it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Everyone therefore that hath heard and hath learned cometh to the Father. We need to come to hear and to learn. In Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3, we used this text last week. Many, will, many people will go and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and He will watch it now teach us. He will teach us His ways, and we will walk in His paths. And out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 13, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Notice this, my friends. Peace in a person's life, God equates to their knowledge of Him. Peace in a person's life is equated to their knowledge of God. A Bible class is important, but you know that these pews can talk. You realize that these pews talk they have something to say 
when we do not come to Bible class. These pews have something to say when they don't when, when they are empty at the worship service. Empty pews, empty pews will say that my occupant found greater joy in some in something else. Uh, my empty pew, my empty seat will say that I'm not concerned about building up the local church. My empty pew will say to the preacher, your lessons are not good and your effort is not appreciated. To the visitor, it says, there is no interest here. To the members, it says, why don't you just get discouraged and quit? To the non-members, it says, regular attendance is neither necessary nor worthwhile. To God, it says, there is something more important than worshiping and learning of you. To Christ, it says, I do not appreciate your sacrifice. Even though you suffered for me, I will not suffer for you. And to the world, it says, I am really on your side. The poet said, I love the church that Jesus built, and I know that it is right. I go there Sunday morning, but not on Wednesday night. I love to sing the songs of God. Such worship must be right. This I do Sunday morning, but not on Wednesday night. God bless our preacher too, and give him power and might to put the sinner in his place, but not on Wednesday night. I love to hear the gospel too. It gives me sure delight. I hear it Sunday morning, but not on Wednesday night. I go through rain and sleet and snow. I do anything that's right to be there Sunday morning, but not on Wednesday night. I know I need more strength to keep me in the fight. For help I come Sunday morning, but not on Wednesday night. And yes, we all must die. I hope I'll be doing right. So may I die on Sunday morning, not on Wednesday night. Do you recognize that if you live 70 years, 10 years of your life will be spent on Sunday, and another 10 years of your life will be spent on Wednesday? In 10 years, you will have 3,650 Sundays and Wednesdays. 3,650 Sundays for us is 7,300 opportunities to worship the Lord and to learn about Him. Sunday service only cheats the Lord out of 3,650 opportunities of you devoting your time to Him. If you add Sunday Bible school that's missed to the Wednesday, you cheat God out of 7,300 opportunities to worship Him, to be with your brethren, and to learn of Him. You know, we will have to answer to God for these decisions, and I'm just not so sure that He will be as sold as we are on our excuses. You know, we need to be interested in the Bible class, not just as a student, but as a teacher. Some have clocked out on Christianity. Some used to do. They used to do, used to do, used to do. Uh, but we're not going to make it to glory on what we used to do. We don't get a golden watch and retire in Christianity. We clock out when we croak out, and then we get ushered out when we've worked it out. But those that quit, it don't work out like that. Coming here and sitting in a pew and singing songs and praying the prayers and listening to a fat, bald-headed teacher preach the Word of God is not Christianity. That's the devil's brand of Christianity. It doesn't cost very much. That kind keeps men lukewarm and makes the Lord Jesus ready to vomit. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 16 to the church at Laodicea. He said that you are neither hot nor cold. And seeing that you are neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm, and I will spew you, vomit you out of my mouth. Verse 19, he said, To those that I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. We need to be interested in coming, but we also need to be interested in leaving. The atheist Voltaire said, There is no hope of destroying the Christian religion, so long as the Lord's day is acknowledged and kept by men as a sacred day, not a sacred hour, 
not a sacred moment, but as a sacred day. But we need to not only be interested as a student, we need to be interested as a teacher in Bible class. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, And they therefore that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. When will this church be built up? When each teacher is interested in approving his or her teaching ability. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, the Bible says, For when for the time that you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again the first principles concerning the oracles of God and have need of milk and not of strong meat. Teachers. He was saying there that each one of us ought to be a teacher. As you read that, the Hebrews writer, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling you for when, for the time, you ought to be teachers. And yet we have so much trouble getting people to teach, getting people to fill in, because I'm just not a teacher. What would help us be a teacher? Personal devotion. We <coughs> preached about that a couple of weeks ago. But when our personal devotion life is what it, is what it should be, we will have the knowledge, we will have the scriptural ability to teach. Not only to teach the lost, but what about the people of like precious faith? The people that's not going to get up and challenge you. The people that agree with you. The people that we're just here to encourage and to edify and to build up. Why not teach? Personal devotion would help us in that area. Seek guidance. Now, we have experienced teachers here that are willing to help. We have experienced teachers here that, that could guide you into becoming a, a good teacher. Uh, what about self-reflection? Uh, you know, I, I think I can do more for the Lord. And maybe it's in the area of taking a class, of teaching, of uh, seeking guidance, of personal devotion, self-reflection. Uh, know your audience. That will help us to become a better teacher. Uh, when we talk to our audience in a way that is appropriate for them to learn at their appropriate age level. You know, a wise old preacher said, if you feed the calves, the cows can get it. If you just put it on a level where the calves can eat, everybody can get some. Know your audience. Also, know your material. That will help you be a, a better Bible teacher. If you come prepared to teach... Knowing the material that you're about to impart to your brethren or to the lost, that would make a great teacher. And also encouraging interaction. If we encourage interaction in our Bible classes and we open the floor up and anybody can make a comment or ask a question, that helps the class. Encouraging that kind of thing. Number five, or just do it. Don't need to forget that. Uh, what helps us be a better teacher? Just do it. Just get some experience under your belt. Number five, what will help us build up the church when each elder and each deacon is dedicated to the work? In Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 28, going down through verse 32, Paul has come to Miletus and he's called the elders from Ephesus. And he knows that this is the last time that he is ever going to see them alive. And he charges them. And he says, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made the overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in, not sparing the flock, and also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore watch. And remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone day and night with tears. Notice that. You remember when we started with Psalm 126 and verse 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Paul said, I went about day and night with tears warning every one of you. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up 
and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Uh, the Bible tells us about elders, I got ahead of myself, that they are to be highly esteemed, if you will, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 13, and esteem them very highly for their work's sake and to be at peace among yourselves. This is a true saying, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. If a man desire the office of a bishop, that is an elder, that is an overseer, uh, he desires a good work. And in Hebrews 13 and verse uh, 17 tells us that we should submit to them that they can do it with joy and not with grief. But the elders have a good work and their work is our collective work. Their work is shepherding the flock and getting the rest of us to work because we are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which the Father hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. Uh, in Hebrews 13, 17, uh, the elders, uh, they define the work as it is under the umbrella of what Christ has sent us to do. They make the decisions and then God holds us responsible and accountable for submitting to them. One who refuses to submit to the, uh, the elders in areas of personal opinion and that are not doctrinal matters are rogue sheep. Rogue sheep do not submit to the shepherd's authority. The elder's authority comes directly from the chief shepherd. There are three areas of divine authority in this world today. There is divine authority that is given to government. God has given our government divine authority. The second line of authority that we have in the world today is in the home. God has given a direct line of authority to the home. And the third direct line of authority that is in the world today is the, the authority from God to the elders. And we are commanded to submit to them. And those who will not submit to the local elders, they will not submit to any elders. And they will answer to the sheep, chief shepherd for it because they have replaced themselves as their own God in their mind and have not room for Christ in their hearts. Do elders and deacons do everything to the best of their ability? Well, I believe that we all do. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10, Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. Uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, I want you to know that as you work, in whatever area you work, in whatever you do, you're working for the Lord. Notice this, Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing, watch this, that of the Lord you receive the reward. Listen to me now. For you serve the Lord Christ. In whatever you do, whether it's going down to the factory, you work as unto the Lord and not to men. Because of the Lord, you receive your reward because you serve the Lord Christ. If you take the trash out here at the East Side Church of Christ, you do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Because of the Lord, you receive your reward and you serve the Lord Christ. You know, the elders have families and jobs whether they're part-time, they're full-time, they're semi-retired. And what needs to happen is we all need to be in the same harness and pulling the same way because there's no I in team. Submission means sacrificing one's personal desires and will for the will and the desires of others. Jesus sacrificed His will for the will of God when He went to the cross. Matthew 26, 36 through 44, as He went to the garden and He fell down on His face and He began to pray, Father, if it is at all possible, 
allow this cup to pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done in all things. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon the form of a servant. That means a bond slave. Jesus humbled himself from equality with God and became a doulos, a slave to his father who became a servant, taking upon him the fashion and the form of a man and being found in that fashion, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <laughs> Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, though he were a son, Yet learned he obedience by the things in which he suffered. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. We are to submit ourselves to God. James chapter 4 and verse 7. We are to submit to one another. Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another in the fear of God. We are to submit to our elders. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. And only those who are humble enough to submit to do, do the will of God in all of these areas will enter into heaven. Read Matthew 18 verses 3 and 4. Unless you become as a little child you will in likewise no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. Does a little child obey you ultimately? Yes. Does a little child love you and forgive you and continue on with you? Yes, he sure does. <coughs> you see, Jonah was given a job to do and he refused to do in Jonah chapter 1. He wasn't going to preach to those wicked Assyrians, but when he shirked his duty, God wrecked his plans, took him to the depths of despair, and then uh, he was swallowed by a great fish. You remember that? In chapter 2, and then Jonah changed his tune. He wanted to do what God would have him to do, and that fish burped him up on the beach, and he hit the beach running, ready to do what God would have him to do, although he had some reluctance and God dealt with him on that area too although he did it with contempt God was able to uh, work about a great revival to the salvation of so many and God can accomplish much good through you even though you may be reluctant Jonah's disobedience did not fare him well. Uh, Peter in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11 uh, Paul withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed Peter's disobedience didn't fare him well. And you know what? Your disobedience won't fare you well either. We need to unite in the same love and in the same mind and in the same spirit focused on the lost. God's challenge to deny ourselves, Matthew 16, 24 through 26. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Deny himself of what? All. All. And take up his cross and follow me. Luke 9, 23, Luke adds the word daily. It's not just a one time taking up the cross. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. So we just need to be focused on working. Just like Jesus, John 9, 4. Uh, he said, the, uh, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for the hour comes when no man can work. Number, number six, when the preacher preaches the word without compromise with love. Just let me talk about me and mine for just a moment. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul said, preach the word be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. And then he said, Speak the truth in love. Until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and to salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. How shall they then call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him and whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
And He commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is uh, which is ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for woe is unto me uh, if I preach not the gospel. And he hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, commit thou the same to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. But I keep under my body and bring it under subjection, lest by any means, after I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. These things speak, and exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. That's the challenge to the preacher. And we need preachers that will not meander in the maze of mediocrity. They will not pander in the pool of popularity or compromise to the crusade of the crowd or topple the truth with timidity. We need life-size men, men filled with the Spirit, wielding the Word and loving the lost, despising the damnation of the disoriented. And in all of this, letting love have the ascendancy John 13 and verse 1, having loved his own, he loved them unto the very end. We need preachers like that. Finally this morning, when will this church be built up? When each member gives love freely to every other member. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, Paul wrote there, Be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. Do you know what this church is? This church is a collection of families. We are individuals that belong to family groups that God has placed in the body here. And we've got to love one another. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for yourselves are taught of God to love one another. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1, the Hebrews writer so succinctly put it, Let brotherly love continue. But the cold shoulder, dismissive, indifferent, uh, the petty attitudes that can be seen today are evidence that the fruit of the Spirit has spoiled on the branch. We don't have the right to name call. We don't have the right to insult. We don't have the right to threaten. We don't have the right to criticize. Titus chapter 3 and verse 2 says, Speak evil of no man. That's not love. I want to show you what love is and what love really looks like. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 4, love suffers long. 2 Peter 3, 9, that's what God, do. God does. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. Love suffers long, and the Bible says, and is kind. Love is kind. And Titus, we just quoted Titus chapter 3 and verse 2, where it says, speak evil of no man. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, uh, the Bible tells us there that we were sometimes ourselves foolish and disobedient. We were deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after this, after this, he says, the kindness and love of God toward man appeared. And that's the kind of love that you and I are to have. It goes on to say that love does not envy. 
You know that envy murdered Abel, Genesis 34, verses 3 through 8. And that, it, that envy enslaved Joseph, Genesis 37, verses 11 and 28. And envy put Jesus on the cross, Matthew 27, 18. For Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered up Jesus. Love does not envy. Love does not vaunt itself. Love doesn't have to have the limelight. Love doesn't have to have the power. Love doesn't have to have the control. Love often works anonymously. And some cover their pride looking for glory by the appearance of love. Love is not puffed up, the text says. Love is not self-centered. Love does not seek its own. Verse 5 1 Corinthians 13, love does not behave itself unseemly. Love is not rude. Love is kind. Love does not act unbecomingly. And it seeks not its own. We quoted Romans 12, 10 earlier, uh, that we need to be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, let each of you look not only for his own things, but for the things of others also. Love is not easily provoked. When your first response is to fly off the handle, you're not filled with love. When the explosive temper just becomes, well, that's just who I am. Well, you're not who Christ wants you to be. And then love thinks no evil. It's, this word thinks is the Greek word logizomai. And it literally means to take no account of. Love thinks no evil. Better translated, love keeps no record of wrong. Love does not keep a tab on wrongdoing. In Isaiah chapter number 38 and verse 17, the Bible tells us that God throws our sins behind His back. And He never looks there again when we're forgiven. He does not keep a record of our wrong as far as the east is from the west. So far has He removed our transgressions from us. God forbid we be so different as to keep a record of the wrongdoings of folks who we have supposedly forgiven. Love thinks no evil. Love puts away the hurt of the past instead of clinging to them. The next thing, verse number 6, love rejoices not in iniquity. Love is willing and wants the best for others, but it rejoices in the truth. Love always stands for and with the truth. Love is pure and it is good like truth. Truth is absolute and nothing to do with what you think or how you feel about it because truth doesn't care how you think or feel about it. Verse number 7, love bears all things. That word bears can be translated covers and here Paul identifies what love is with Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. And above all have fervent charity, fervent love for one another because what does love do? Love covers a multitude of sins. Love bears all things. It believes all things. Love believes the best. Uh, it never believes evil unless facts demanded in the current. It hopes all things. Love has confidence in the future. It endures all things. Love doesn't give up. It destroys enemies by making them friends. You know, we can all bear some things. We can all believe some things. But God calls us to a deeper love for Him and for our brethren, for the lost. And he says, it bears all things. Verse 8, love never fails. The kind of love that will turn the world upside down. This kind of love fixes relationships at home and abroad. This is the love of God. And God says that we can manifest it in each of our lives. The East Side Church of Christ is a group of people who serve an amazing God under the headship of the amazing Christ. And with all of our flaws and weaknesses and sins, it's an honor to be a member here. It's an honor to labor here. When will this church be built up, you ask? 
when every member does what God would have them to do, when every Christian is what God would have them to be, when every spouse is to their partner what God would have them to be, when every parent is to their children what God would have them to be, when every talent is developed, when every seed is sown, when worship is raised with zeal and vigor, when we practice what we actually believe, the first century church didn't have a fraction of the ability that we have today, yet every creature under heaven's dome heard their voice in the first century. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 6, Colossians 1 23. Why aren't we built up? It's because of me and because of you. God will forgive us for our failures, and he will help us help each other be the best that we can be for Him. I don't know your spiritual condition at this time, but God offers you pardon. He offers you pardon if you'll just believe in His Son, in His Son Jesus, John 8 and 24. If you will repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3. Confess the sweet name of Jesus, Romans 10 and verse 10. And be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. He will pardon and cleanse you. Maybe you've done that. But for some reason you have sin in your life. Maybe you want to be better for the East Side Church of Christ. Maybe you want to be better for yourself and for your family. You can make that right right now as together we stand and sing. <laughs>